Next, we'd like to talk about how you build an effective calorimeter. So a calorimeter is the experimental vessel that we mentioned last time in which you run a calorimetry or a thermochemistry experiment. The idea behind a calorimeter is you're building an insulated container which will trap any heat that's absorbed or released as part of the chemical reaction or the process that you're studying. So you can think of a calorimeter as essentially a styrofoam cooler with a port for a thermometer to go in so you can study a temperature change of the process and ideally some type of mechanical mechanism to stir the reaction, particularly if it's happening in water. So what you need for a calorimeter is you need a closed insulated vessel, a thermometer and a stirrer. So basically you have your insulated vessel, you can think of it like a styrofoam cooler. You have a port where you can put a thermometer down through and you have some device for stirring that will allow you to stir it without letting any heat that might be released or absorbed in the reaction come out of the insulated container and into the rest of the world. So in your calorimeter, you're trying to restrict the surroundings to the space inside the calorimeter and your chemical reaction or the physical process that you're studying, like water freezing or melting, goes inside the calorimeter. So you have a thermal insulator, thermometer, stirrer, that's your calorimeter. The simplest calorimeter that you can design, which is surprisingly effective, is if you double stacked two styrofoam coffee cups together and you had a lid with a hole for a thermometer and a hole for a manual stirring apparatus, that makes for an effective calorimeter and it's one that you'll likely be using at some point in lab this term. So basically, you assemble your calorimeter, insulated walls, lid, thermometer, stirrer, and then you set whatever chemical reaction or physical process that you want to measure inside the calorimeter. And so the idea is if your reaction is exothermic, something like an acid-base neutralization happening in water, any heat that comes out of the chemical reaction is trapped in the water inside the calorimeter. And if you can measure the water the temperature change associated with the water in which the reaction is being carried out, then you have a delta T that you can use along with the mass of the water and the specific heat of the water to calculate the total heat released by the reaction. So what you're really doing with a calorimeter is you're making a small space, which we're going to call the surroundings, that's insulated for a short amount of time from the rest of the universe and any heat that's gained or released by a chemical reaction happening inside the calorimeter comes only from the space that's inside the calorimeter, whether that's water or air. There are also more specialized types of calorimeters out there. One that you might have some experience with later on in your scientific career is called a bomb calorimeter which is particularly useful in nutritional chemistry and studying the chemistry of combustion reactions. So a bomb calorimeter is a special type of calorimeter that's used to study energy changes in combustion reactions. And the key is that the bomb calorimeter is designed so that the reaction can take place at constant volume. And if your reaction is taking place at constant volume, gases that may be evolved in the reaction can't do any expansion work. And so it allows you to relate the temperature change to the total energy available in whatever fuel source you burned up, not just the amount of heat energy that's released. It ensures that all the energy is released in the form of heat energy. So a bomb calorimeter is a special type, much more advanced type of calorimeter, much more expensive type of calorimeter that you may get some experience with farther down the line in your scientific career, but broadly in principle, it works the same. The only idea is that it ensures that the reaction can't expand as it's carried out. So all the energy released in the reaction has to be released as heat. And the key with any calorimeter, particularly a coffee cup calorimeter, which is kind of the default calorimeter setup we'll use for our in-class word problems and our laboratory experiments this term, is that your calorimeter is designed so that you can measure the mass of whatever goes into the calorimeter. You can look up the specific heat of whatever goes into the calorimeter in table 9.1. And with the calorimeter, you can measure the temperature change associated with your process. 
And so if you know mass, specific heat, and temperature change, you can calculate heat flow using the calorimetry equation. And so that's really how all basic laboratory calorimetry experiments are carried out. We'll know the mass of what's in the calorimeter. We can figure out its specific heat. What we're actually measuring is the temperature change using the thermometer, and from that we can calculate the heat flow. So what we're going to do next is we're going to look at a couple of examples where we use the calorimetry equation in conjunction with data from calorimetry experiments to calculate things like the total amount of heat exchanged as a result of a chemical reaction, or use the total amount of heat exchanged as a metal cools in a calorimeter to determine the specific heat of the metal. So I'll see you back here for those in a few minutes.